Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. WhatsApp has always been considered an encrypted form of communication where the content exchange between the two parties is not monitored, yet new evidence suggests that the technology companies can censor speech on the platform. This is, of course, an act that is done under government coercion. This evidence is critical in ultimately holding government agencies and government officials accountable for their involvement in the unconstitutional crime of speech censorship. Lawsuits have already been filed by groups over the government's speech censorship efforts over the past two years. Elon Musk and some top experts are calling for a temporary halt to more advanced AI research before it ultimately causes irreversible and far-reaching harm to humanity. Current research has spiraled out of control in a way that even the creators of AI can't control or predict where it will go. The cryptocurrency platform FTX has been charged with a new crime, bribing Chinese Communist Party officials. This huge bribe fee deepened Alameda's financial losses and it eventually triggered FTX's bankruptcy. FTX's bankruptcy in turn triggered a series of troubles in the cryptocurrency industry. This includes the current lawsuits against cryptocurrency companies by U.S. regulators. So are traditional financial institutions trying to wipe out the cryptocurrency industry. Each side has a different opinion. A young man succeeded in getting the University of North Carolina School of Medicine to drop diversity criteria in admissions. His goal was to eliminate color-based admission criteria from the nation's medical schools. Okay, let's get into it. On Tuesday, New York federal prosecutors announced a new indictment against cryptocurrency FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried. They accused him of conspiring to pay more than $40 million in bribes to Chinese communist government officials to unfreeze his Alameda research account, which was a hedge fund that was frozen by Beijing. These accounts hold over a billion dollars in cryptocurrency. These accounts were frozen by the CCP around November of 2021. The indictment states that SBF and his associates considered and tried various methods to unfreeze the accounts. After legal and personal efforts failed, SBF directed and transferred at least $40 million in cryptocurrency to one or more CCP officials. SBF's account was unfrozen when the bribe money was transferred from Alameda's primary trading account to a private cryptocurrency wallet. After the account was unfrozen, SBF authorized the transfer of tens of millions of dollars in additional cryptocurrency to Chinese communist officials as the final payment for the bribe. Thereafter, SBF's hedge funds used unfrozen assets to continue to fund Alameda's losing trades, continuing a year-long fraud against clients and investors. It continued to defraud clients and investors for another year until November of 2022, when its debt worries turned into a verifiable bank run followed by a collapse. Sam Bankman-Fried has previously been charged with eight counts, including fraud, campaign finance violations, and money laundering. Prosecutors say that SBF stole billions of dollars in client funds to cover losses at the hedge fund Alameda. But SBF only admitted to FTX's risk management improprieties, and he denied stealing money. With the collapse of FTX, which was the world's third largest cryptocurrency exchange at the end of last year, trouble in the $1 trillion cryptocurrency industry has increased exponentially. U.S. regulators have continued to sue cryptocurrency-related companies. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, along with the Federal Reserve and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, warn banks not to allow the risks of cryptocurrency to be transferred to the financial system. Barney Frank, the former congressman known for the Dodd-Frank Act, said that the regulators want to send a message to get people away from crypto. The cryptocurrency industry believes that these moves have the potential to impact the future of U.S. cryptocurrencies. But traditional financiers have been questioning whether digital tokens have any fundamental value. They see little value in digital assets and they are concerned about the lack of protection for investors. The Fed and others have not said that they will prevent banks from dealing with cryptocurrency customers, but simply require them to operate within the law and to manage risk properly. 
However, the warnings from regulators and the risks themselves appear to have had an impact on bank executives. Swan Bitcoin CEO Corey Clipston said that Citigroup closed his corporate account and his personal account late last year without any explanation. Several other banks have also scaled back their openness to this digital asset class. Even executives at cryptocurrency-friendly Signature Bank said last year that they plan to reduce the volume of cryptocurrency-related deposits to less than 20%. The Blockchain Association has vowed to investigate the cause of regulators debanking of cryptocurrency companies. The association has recently submitted public information requests to the FDIC, the Fed, and the OCC regarding allegations of debanking, such as bank account closures and difficulties for companies to open new accounts. Some Republicans also believe that now, much of it is reminiscent of the same regulatory abuses in the Operation Choke Point. Operation Choke Point is an Obama-era program designed to disallow banks from financing gun dealers and payday lenders. However, not all cryptocurrency companies believe the industry is being unfairly attacked, and Clipston, the CEO of Swan Bitcoin, regards the concerted efforts of federal regulators to debank the cryptocurrency industry as a conspiracy theory. He believes the reason why banks are turning away cryptocurrency depositors is because of the risk. Especially after the series of bankruptcies and frauds that rocked the market last year, including FTX, Celsius, and Voyager. Clipston believes that it's natural for banks to take action to reduce their exposure to cryptocurrency businesses in such situations. With thousands of banks and lenders, Clipston said that as long as the company has a solid business, there will be a bank willing to take it on. The White House pressured Meta to restrict messages on WhatsApp, according to newly disclosed emails. One of the emails was sent to Meta executives by Rob Flaherty, who was an assistant to the president in March of 2021. He asked about how WhatsApp was going to reduce harm. He wrote in one email, I'm genuinely curious, how do you know what kinds of messages you've cut down on? Assuming you've got a good mouse trap here, that's the kind of info we're looking for, what interventions you've taken and what you'd found to work and not work. Flaherty and Andrew Slavitt, who was then the White House's top COVID-19 advisor, have been pressuring meta executives to act on alleged COVID-19 misinformation, saying that even if such information were true, it would lead to hesitation about the vaccine. Flaherty added in another email, I guess I have the same question here as I do on Facebook on, or Instagram. Do you guys think you have this under control? How are you measuring success, reduction in forwarding, measured impact across Facebook properties? This email came after Slavit held a call with Meta officials in which they discussed WhatsApp. A Meta executive responded that Meta was taking steps to address alleged misinformation. The executive said WhatsApp seeks to control the spread of misinformation and inform users through deliberate content agnostic product intervention, things like labeling and limiting message forwards. After the limits on highly forwarded messages were introduced early in the COVID-19 pandemic, those messages were reduced by 70% globally, according to the executive. Lawyer Robert F. Kennedy Jr., along with his group, Children's Health Defense and Louisiana resident Connie Sampanaro, brought a lawsuit in U.S. court in Louisiana against Biden and top officials over how they pressured big tech to censor users. The suit states, it's well established that the government violates the Constitution if it uses coercive threats to induce private parties to censor protected speech or if it engages in collusive joint action with private parties to violate the First Amendment. Officials including Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and White House aide Rob Flaherty are among the defendants. The lawsuit is based in part on documents from government and large technology companies that were found in a lawsuit that was filed by the Attorneys General of Louisiana and Missouri. 
Government officials have made repeated efforts to get these companies to take action against users. The lawsuit states that the censorship efforts are responsible even now for the online suppression of facts and opinions about the COVID vaccines that might lead people to become hesitant about COVID vaccine mandates, depriving Americans of information and opinion on matters of the highest public importance. Kennedy himself was a victim of such government actions. Kennedy was banned from multiple platforms, including Instagram. The indictment quotes U.S. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart saying, censorship reflects a society's lack of confidence in itself. It is a hallmark of an authoritarian regime. Mary Holland, the president and general counsel for Children's Health Defense added, if government can censor its critics, there is no atrocity it can't commit. The public has been deprived of truthful life and death information over the last three years. This lawsuit aims to have the government censorship end, and it must because it is unlawful under our Constitution. The suit was assigned to U.S. District Judge Terry Doughty, who is a Trump appointee who is also overseeing the other case. Doughty recently rejected the government's attempt to dismiss that action. Elon Musk and many AI experts and business leaders have signed an open letter calling on all AI labs to immediately suspend training of AI systems that are more powerful than GTP-4. Otherwise, it could endanger society and all of humanity. Among the signatories were tech luminaries such as Elon Musk, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, Stability AI founder Ahmad Mustaki, along with AI heavyweight scientists Joshua Bengio and Stuart Russell. The letter points out that a lot of research has shown that the AI industry is not as good as it should be. The letter also points out that a large number of studies have shown that AI systems with the ability to compete with humans could pose a profound risk to society and humanity, which is a point acknowledged by top AI labs. We will discuss in detail what these top experts call profound risk to society and humanity on our membership site. A young man of Chinese descent has recently received media attention for speaking out against diversity, equity, and inclusion DEI programs at universities. Kenny Xu, the son of first-generation immigrants from China who is 25 years old, launched a campaign in January to eliminate the DEI policy at UNC, the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, and so far he has collected over a thousand signatures from North Carolina residents. Last month, UNC trustees voted to ban DEI requirements from hiring and tenure decisions thanks to the efforts of Kenny Shu and his team, Color Us United. But Kenny doesn't think this result is that impressive. His goal is to eliminate DEI from universities across the United States. He said that for most Americans, regardless of their political persuasion, they want to be treated by the most qualified doctors. They don't care if the doctor is white, black, yellow, or green. They just want to be treated by the most qualified and best trained doctor. The medical school is teaching a lot of courses that are not related to medicine due to the influence of wokeism. He uses the UNC School of Medicine as an example. Courses such as understanding and responding to microaggressions. That is, how to describe constructive criticism as racist. Another course is how to view and treat patients based on race. And another is understanding how the U.S. healthcare system is structurally racist. These courses are included in the medical school curriculum. Kenny said, it's a terrible thing to not teach doctors basic medical knowledge, but to teach unconscious bias, to teach them that medical issues are all based on race. Kenny Shu is the author of the book An Inconvenient Minority and the host of the podcast Inconvenient Minority, which does deep dive investigations into race, identity, and culture. He found that in college, Chinese and Asian students who studied well were described by the left as privileged. As a second generation immigrant, Kenny said that his parents came to the U.S. with no money or social connections. So how did they get the so-called privilege? His accomplishments this year were earned through hard work. 
then, he realized that this is not just an attack on Asians, it's an attack on all the hard workers in our country. And this attack is being done in the name of diversity, equality, and inclusion. He cited Harvard's admission policy, which requires Asians to score 273 points higher than blacks to get in. Xu said, we should not use race to hire, we should not use race to promote. We should not use race to admit either for or against anybody. We should strive to treat people as individuals. Affected by the global high inflation, Germany's major trade unions launched a general strike demanding higher wages. Since January 27th, Germany's airports, buses and train stations are almost all shut down. Even the service industry is also affected. The German Sunday Picture newspaper said this is the most serious strike in 31 years. Many media reported that the two largest unions in Germany, Verdi and EVG, representing millions of employees at airports, railroads and buses, have launched a general strike. This has resulted in almost all transportation around the country being shut down. Not only the two major airports in Munich and Frankfurt, but also Dusseldorf, Cologne, Stuttgart, Berlin, Bremen and Hamburg have joined the strike. More than 380,000 passengers were affected and those who were stranded had to sleep on benches in the airport. Dutch Bahn DB, the German rail operator, also canceled most of its train services and it suspended trains in many areas. DB described the national strike as excessive and groundless and unnecessary and urged the union to return to the bargaining table immediately. Frank Wernick, the head of the German service industry union Verdi, however, accused labor of being underpaid and overworked to the point of exhaustion. The union is now demanding a 10.5% to 12% wage increase or the strike will continue, but the employer says that these demands are unacceptable. They offered a 5% wage increase. Okay, this is our show for today. But before we go, I want to remind you that tomorrow we will have our show on Front Page International. For those of you who don't know, we also have a YouTube channel called Front Page International. So tomorrow we'll have our show there at our regular time on YouTube at Front Page International. We'll be covering the latest American and international news. So please make sure to join us for that episode as well. I look forward to seeing you there in the live chat. Okay, thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.